This is the BBC. Hello, I'm Helen Mark, and thanks for downloading this episode of Radio 4's Open Country podcast, a series that brings you fascinating stories from every corner of the UK countryside. We hope you enjoy it. There goes the ferry, back across to Tay and Lone, stranding us on the island of Gia for this week's Open Country. And it's a landscape which is owned by the community who live here. It was the second community buyout of an island in Scotland. And it all sounds like a dream. It's this wonderful idea, a utopian idea that you all live together and share together. But when the laird goes, where do you get the money from to do things? You don't get the cash injections. And if you're a community who have to make decisions together, you therefore have to get along with one another. So I wonder if it could also have somewhat nightmarish aspects. This is one of the most fascinating landscapes I think that there is. Not just because of how it looks, but because of how it's owned and perhaps what it represents. I'm off to meet Tony Philpin, a teacher by day on the mainland, and the Uber volunteer for the Coast and Countryside Group on Gear. The reason it's such a unique place is because it's, it's, it's very small. It's kind of like a little microcosm, not necessarily of the highlands, but certainly of the Hebrides. Uh, so it's such a dense landscape, you know. I mean, uh, we've had archaeologists here who reckon that every second rock they trip over is a, a, some kind of archaeological remain, and that's probably not far from the truth. Really? And south, I guess, of Glasgow. If we went... No, we're actually, we're actually on a par with Glasgow. Oh, right. Is it good for walkers here? Uh, it would be good for walkers. Everywhere is very nearby and very close. We could walk from here to Carn Ban, which is a mile away. It would be along the shore and then up through the heather. It would take us an hour. It's yeah. one mile. Yeah. The terrain is incredibly rough here. What are you trying to do with reinstating the paths on gear? Well, the Coast and Countryside Group are hoping to get a project going with the Trust, of course, who own, own the entire island, to open up paths and trails to the west of the island, to the amazing coastline and, and coastal features, but also to some of the uh, our best archaeological features, so that visitors who tend to congregate in Ardminish Bay ar- around the ferry uh, on those lovely sandy beaches there come further afield and see the rest of the island. Tell me about the Fisherman's Cave. Oh, the Fisherman's Cave is barely three, four hundred metres from here. Except it would take us an hour to get there. Except that <laughs> you wouldn't be able to find it anyway. Yeah. So, hundreds of years ago, when they were sailing skiffs, they couldn't sail into this stuff at all. They would have to stay here. Yeah. So they would go to the lee side of Gear, and there are caves. Because uh, it's the rising coastline, these are all sea caves which have been pushed up above sea level as the islands risen and seas fallen due to the sort of isostatic readjustment after the glaciation. And in the cave there's carvings, there's initials that go back 1708, 1709, Gosh. there's a little skull and crossbones there and the names of the ships, uh, the, the wee boats that they sailed in. And it's a lovely spot. We've got a photograph of it on our, on our Facebook page for the Countryside Group. We get a lot of, a lot of people pick up that. We can put a post up on our little Facebook page, and it's a tiny little island, there's only 160-odd of us, and we can have 3,000 to 4,000 people looking at the images. I think because... In a day or two. Yeah, I think that's because there are people like me. I've travelled past on my way to mm. Campbelltown. And, and saw this island in sunset and thought, oh, oh that's yes, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It has a romantic appeal to people. It's like, I, this is a terrible word, it's, it's like a, a dream utopia yeah. with palm trees yeah, yeah. And, and where people share. And uh, well, Is that a dream, do you think? Or? Well, it's, not, it's not real because it's the same as every community. There are people who squabble, there are people who don't get on, there are little feuds. And yet there's a sort of general sense of well-being here. It's a great place to bring up children. So if you're young, if you're into playing computer games, 
sorry we don't have a great broadband speed in fact it's pretty useless we don't have 4g but if you want to get oh, no. out no i'm afraid <laughs> not if you want to get out and play on the beaches or go crabbing it's paradise don dennis is an american entrepreneur who bought Ackermore House from the Trust. It's the biggest house on gear. It was the Laird's house and it has Ackermore Gardens, which have grown up over the years, which were mostly planted by the Horlicks family. But Don is interested in orchids. But come March, you can certainly get a day or two when it would burn the leaves really? very quickly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Come on in. My specs are misting up. Yeah. I've never been in an orchid house before. I always think they're a bit sinister. Oh my goodness. I don't know where you get that notion from. Have, have a look at this one next to you. There's a Paphia pedalum. Yeah, that could look a little sinister. The dark purple, etc. But look down here, you've got this delicate pink one. A Phragmopidium hanapapo. Uh, that is superb. Because the climate on gear is... Uh, temperate, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's regarded as one of the warmest places in Scotland. Well, that's right. I didn't come here because of that, but I very soon discovered that I'd landed on one of the best places, not only in the UK, but in the whole of Europe, to grow tropical orchids. Yeah. So, why did you come here? Oh, well, my primary business for the last 20, 25 years has been flower essences in the genre, in the tradition of the Bach flower remedies, the rescue remedy and all that, 85% of our business is our own orchid essence work. Yeah. The islanders had put up Ackermore House for sale. Because that had been part of the community buyout, had it? Ackermore House came with the island that right. the islanders, that the community buyout entailed. But they needed to repay one million of the four million pounds that had been uh, given to them to, for the community buyout from public funds and they had to repay that million pounds within two years and they did a lot of sponsored haircuts and sponsored rowing and sponsored <laughs> cake baking and so that's a but lot it's, of hair it's a lot of hair to cut to raise a million so the only viable asset that was you know, relatively easy to, to sell was the house they preferred my approach because I was bringing a, a business with jobs so when you bought this place, you're in a sort of chain of lairds, except no, you're not the laird. I'm not a laird at all. You're I, the first of them to be here, and not the laird, but just part of the Well, community. no, no. Uh, first of all, very clearly, all right. I'm not a laird. No. I only bought a house. Yeah. The lairds owned the island. So you, no, you wanted no part of that? because what I loathed it. Yeah. I loathed it. Because it's acted like a filter for people's perceptions of me and I noticed that there was this kind of insidious thing if I thought of it at all a kind of insidious poison of how you thought of yourself because what does a title like that do but make you feel like you're set apart from others that's that's a ridiculous thing to do what is a little different is that because of the island it's a community. I would say far more than because of the buyout. When you move to an island, it's like getting into a rowboat with others. And you might not get along with everybody in that rowboat, but when suddenly the waves start swelling up and the wind's blowing, everybody has to pull together. Mm -hmm. So there is a sense here of people helping each other out. That's, that's important. It's a very important part of community life. And I, I love that. If you're sailing up the west coast of Scotland, you are going to come past Gia. If you were a, a Neolithic trader in Flints, going between Great Orm Head and, and Orkney, you would come past Gia and come for fresh water. If you were Vikings, you'd shelter in the Lee of Gia and, and fill up on fresh water. Everyone comes past Gia. The Royal Yacht Britannia used to come past Gia. It's a motorway service station of the sea. Just a very pretty one. Keep the wheels of the fire engine coming. Keep the 
Oh, yeah. oh, okay, Andy. Let's see. Akers, we just stopped. Akers just having a chat with uh, the firemen. There's one fireman, retained fireman, and uh, some volunteers. What happens with the, the doctor? The doctor comes on a Wednesday. That's when you want to be ill. I wonder when the dustmen come. I, I become fascinated by the grain of life. How do you do this and how do you do that? Because we're an island. Would the ferry run on a day like this? Oh yeah, this is not bad. So there's a ferry across the mainland, but you can fly in. The uh, trust on their Facebook page say, uh, if you'd like to fly into gear, let us know and we'll clear the sheep from the runway. The landing strip, anyway. I'm here with, what do I call you, Alexander? Alistair? My gear name is Acker. Acker O'Neill. MacNeil. Acker MacNeil. Oh, yes. All means grandson, Mac means son of. Huge, huge apologies. Not at all. When I first moved to the countryside in the 80s, I said to a chap, how long do I have to live in the country to be accepted as a local? And he said, you need three generations in the grave. How many generations have you got in the Roughly grave? Roughly about 40, 41. <laughs> so the McNeils, you were the lairds of, of gear. They were. In fact, they were sold by one of my ancestors to a yachtsman by the name of Scarlet. We never really ever, and don't let anybody tell you different, we never had any real bad landlords. I personally would rather have a benevolent dictator than this so-called democracy we have. Yeah. And, and yet, I mean, you're involved with the trust, with the buyout? I am the company secretary. Right. So you're on the... You're I am a director. a director. I'm a director. I elected on to the, by the people. I personally, and I'm, I'm not ashamed because people know, I voted against. Not that I didn't want the island wanted very much, but I knew that it would be difficult, it would great difficulty in running the place. And we still have a lot to pay back yet. I mean, it's, it's, it's not utopia. The farming system has changed uh -huh. because it's, it's the way the world has gone. People don't, we don't grow potatoes, corn, oats or barley or, you know, it's all in the grass, silage, silage. And there's not the same amount of people working on the land. There was at least 40 to 45 people working the land and we had 12 working farms now we only have two now and the island was a showpiece it's rugged now when, when you say it's rugged now the, the, the landscape itself has well, changed well there's all these before there there were fields up the back there and my late cousin Angus and Neil you know there were so you can all... see patches of green up yes, on the hillside was, yeah. he had reclaimed so much I was interested in what you said about this not being utopia. And, and I wondered if that's one of the problems, that people come to places like this, think, it, I mean, I, that's a mistake I might have made. Well, it You is, think it's going to be this idyllic island life. There are palm trees. Actually. Yes, in the summer, <laughs> it is the most, I have lived all over the world. And there is nowhere better than here in a summer's day. But then people come, and then, oh, well, they live here. But then the winter comes, and the gales come, and the wind comes, and the rain comes. And they can't get off the island, or they can't get back on. And this is where, you know, the idea of utopia changes, and they get quite bitter. Could it become utopia? I mean, well, what would you like to see happen? We, I'm going to make you lead for a day. No. <laughs> I would try and bring in young people because without children we have nothing we need children so that we have teachers and people get educated and then come back and get some good businesses going we need people that come into the island we need them to have jobs there was a study done quite near the beginning of the formation of the trust that indicated that a population of about 200 was a kind of kind of peak sustainable population of gear we are sitting at about 165, 170 or something like that. Yeah. I think if you were to introduce another 30 people off the bat, you would see unemployment. I'm with Joe Teal, who owns the shop here on Gear. When you came here as a 15-year-old and now you're here as a 20 years later, <laughs> in that time the buyout happened, 
Has it been a good thing, do you think? It's without doubt, without question, it's been a good thing. There was somebody came up to me and, you know, a local person and they'd said, wasn't it terrible now? I had to say, well, yes, isn't it terrible that we've got B&Bs that can flourish, we've got a boathouse restaurant, we've got more kids in our school. People are able, if they have the means, to buy and own their own houses for the first time, that we've spent about four million quid over the history of the Trust in improving, insulating, upgrading the homes that the Trust owns so that people aren't got water running down their walls and aren't catching bronchitis and whatever else, you know, isn't it terrible? Because it really isn't. Now, is it perfect? Absolutely not. Without doubt, there's more squabbling, more infighting, perhaps more cliquey aspects to living here than there perhaps was prior to the formation of the Trust, but you've got to take the rough with the smooth. That, see, that's beautiful, isn't it? That's that's part of the reason I've always wanted to come to Gear is because of that. It's because, oh well, because I'm a hippie Joe, and because I think that people should cooperate and find a way to work together, and it's a sort of belief system which I've imposed from afar. So I've had a fictional Gear where everybody, you know, goes, oh hello, everything's lovely. Yes, yeah. although it's not like that. No you still think it's better? It's without doubt better, in my opinion. You know, there was benevolent landlords who had done things like setting up Ackermore Gardens, you know, essentially put Gia on the map. So you can't say, as some might, that private ownership of land is exclusively bad, because it isn't. But there was a sustained period of underinvestment in the fabric of this island, and the population had declined. But... If it was bad, and if it was worse than it used to be, then there's no explanation for why the population has increased by nearly 100%. Whoa. Really? 100%? Yeah. It was 92 yeah. at the time of the community buyout. And like I say, it's like 170 or something now. Yeah. So that's nearly double the folk. That tells its own story. Why did you come back after university? What, what is it about gear that made you want to be here? Well... I suspect it would have been quite unlikely for an, another landlord to have looked so favourably upon our application. Here I was, just 20, my business partner, 21, got alcohol sales licences from our Gale Butte Council, very young at that time to be able to do that. Officially, I was the youngest licence holder in, in Scotland at that time. And you knew you were supported because the community directorship helped you along with the process Mm -hmm. made sure that you were offered terms that made it possible for you to 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 succeed and you know that that in my mind says you're supported here yeah you are wanted you are wanted as somebody with ideas somebody with energy somebody with a young family you you are wanted and needed here yeah well that's how that's how i look at it and uh, you know will you get that elsewhere maybe but I don't know. No. I just know I get it here. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, what you know, it's 8.15 in the morning and the sun is starting to come up over the Mull of Kintyre and I'm with Elaine Morrison, who is the uh, Gear Heritage Trust manager, and I'm sort of in heaven. It's sort of heaven, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, the mornings here are particularly lovely. You know, kind of you just sort of begin to see the changing light. It goes from darkness, then there's this sort of glow from the east. And then all of a sudden you see the lights of the ferry coming up from the South Pier first thing in the morning. And then life sort of begins to slowly start. And it's always a slow, slow start on Gia. And a slow, slow day on Gia actually as well. <laughs> but uh, I kind of like it that way. How does the trust operate? You know, if you're an, someone who lives on the island, what are your rights and responsibilities and how do you get to... How does it work, the, the Land Ownership Trust? So we're a membership organisation and anyone who is registered to vote is eligible to be a member. We operate incredibly democratically. 
some people would say too democratically, <laughs> if we've got any major decisions to take. We elect a board of directors, a voluntary board of directors from the membership, and they have the, the oversight for the sort of strategic direction and management of the island. But if we have major decisions to make, you know, for example, one of the things we're looking at at the moment is a campsite down by the ferry slip. That decision has to be taken by the whole membership. They have to have an opportunity to vote on whether or not that's a development that they would like to see go ahead. And, you know, obviously it's a, not necessarily like running an election campaign, you know, but you do have to sort of make sure that people are well informed of the reasons why things are happening and let them put forward their views, answer any questions. You know, it has to be very participative. It could be better, I have to say. Um, I think that we definitely could do that better. But in, in principle, the, the members ultimately have the sort of the final say on any sort of major decisions that are taken about how the island operates, what kind of development we do. You know, we don't want to overdevelop the island, none of us do. We want to look at what is actually viable, sustainable, and what helps us preserve the thing that's really special about Gia. And for each and every one of us, that thing that's special about Gia, it will be different. But most of us, I think, will just have this notion that it's a special place and we don't want to change it too much. But we do need to make sure that we can continue to develop, to make sure that young people can stay and that people continue to live here and it doesn't become a holiday home destination. Yeah. So if the Heritage Trust is the lead, are you the factor? Yeah, I know. That's a really strange thing to get my head around. Yeah. And where we are at the moment in my garden, overlooking the sort of the main part of the island, we're overlooking Edmunds Village. But you've got this sort of oversight. And I was sitting here one day uh, a couple of months ago and I said to my husband, you know, actually, this feels like the factor's house. You know, this is you can watch the comings and going. You can see who's coming in and out of the pub. You know, you can sort of, oh, oh, there he goes again. There goes James driving up to the top of the island again. What's he doing? But effectively, yeah, that is the role. Do you have to look after things like, I mean, Ackermore Gardens? Yeah. You know, so James Horlix was the lead in sort of designing the gardens. Um, I should say that there's also Sir Frank Ovaltine. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but here on Gia we have a preference, of course. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are your plans? To... Yeah, Ackermore Gardens in the past few years has fallen into sort of a, a bit of a state where sort of nature has been winning. We've not had much of a resource in terms of gardening and it's beginning to take its toll. We want to restore Ackermore Gardens, not restore it to Horlicks days, you know, and that's impossible. But what we need to do is to find a way that we can kind of look at what's Ackermore Gardens' role into the future. People love to come here and go to Ackermore Gardens that still has a reputation and we want to make sure that it's somewhere that people can come, they can enjoy, they can get a sense of its history, of its cultural heritage. Perhaps we let nature in. We can't afford to employ a mass gardening team. We're lucky if we can afford to employ one gardener at the moment. But we are looking at the possibility of uh, heritage lottery funding. How can we look at bringing the walled garden back into food production as it was in the past? My car is at number one on the queue to leave, waiting for the ferry. If I took the handbrake off, down it would go into the water. Uh, there's no one else in the queue. It's about half an hour wait till it comes over. It strikes me that, that the island, it's, it's not just an island, but it's also a metaphor. And, and I, as somebody who had passed it by and thought about it, had, had freighted it with loads of expectations. And I know it's a bit naughty of me, but, but some of my expectations have been met. And even the ones that haven't been met have filled me with hope. It's a bit like Romania in 1989. The dictators have gone. And now we, the people, are in charge. And how do you make that work? That's clearly going to be a challenge because you've got politics. And that's maybe problematic in a small community. But a small community which is open, which has to be open to incomers, to fresh bloods, to young people. I've met young people who say this place has given them a chance, has given them an opportunity. I've got tears in my eyes. Thank you, Gia, for having me for a couple of days. I'd like to come back as soon as I can. Up the people. Thanks for listening. If you want to hear more Open Countries, there are programmes going back to 2009 available on the BBC Radio 4 Open Country website.